Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War Frontline Update for the 10th of June 2024. First thing to note is that this is a two-day update. I was unable to get an update out yesterday, so sorry for that. I have also uh, taken off Syriac maps, so that whole red area of the occupied territories of Ukraine is taken off because they haven't mapped since June the 4th, so that's six days of not mapping, and I think it would maybe skew what's going on uh because you might think they they are claiming something else and the other mappers aren't well actually they're just out of t well to be honest i don't know they may be on holiday somebody's claimed that there was talk about them going on holiday whatever they uh haven't mapped for uh, that long i'll bring them back on when they come back online and update their mapping so that's that we're going to go up to sumi first so we've had this attack into Kharkiv from the russians they've also been threatening an attack in uh, into Sumi from Kursk, but Sumi is very well defended. It has excellent fortifications. The governor there has been uh, really very good in preparing Sumi for any eventuality, and I think it would be ill advised of the Russians, who supposedly have maybe 15,000 troops in that area, to attack there. There were these rumors that came out last night that I didn't report from. Um, were essentially Kadyrov. Apparently, Ahmad took control of a village uh, called Rizhdivka, Rizhivka, sorry, that was then denied. The Ukrainians completely denied that, said, hey, that's not happened. This is across the border from Tetkino, which is, I think, one of the places that might have been attacked uh, before when there were these border raids. Anyway, what has happened, Anton Gerashenko says, a Russian telegram channel blamed Kadyrov for the deaths of over 20 Russian soldiers. Uh, after his post of Akhmat Chechnya uh, uh, taking Ukrainian Rizhivka, which they didn't actually do, or Ukrainian authorities confirmed. So that's this place. Claim was they took it, didn't do it. And then there's been this situation. Now, according to the EU Telegram channel, after Kadyrov's post, Ukrainian defenders hit that group of soldiers that supposedly had taken this place but hadn't. Here is a Telegram post. Ramzan Kadyrov was blamed for the deaths of more than 20 Russian soldiers in the Kursk region. Ramzan Kadyrov, having announced the liberation of Rizhivka village near Kursk region, has put our military in danger. There are losses. Sources in the general staff told us about that. Quote, it's not the first time we entered, have entered Rizhivka. Our scouts go there all the time. But this idiot decided to boast about hell knows what. As a result, the enemy hit a group of soldiers near the border in the Kursk region. We have 21 dead. One of them said, according to another, the military are going to appeal personally to Vladimir Putin with a call to punish Kadyrov for the deaths for their, of their comrades and, quote, for the lawlessness that his Chechens are committing without bringing any benefit to the front. Ramzan Aktam, Aktamatovich's entourage responded to these claims with the words, quote, they can't fight themselves, they're just jealous. Jealous shaitans. Uh, so there's this issue. Well, I mean, the Ukrainians are sitting back and eating their popcorn as well as, you know, watching this unfold. They have indeed uh, attacked you, uh, Russian soldiers there. And I'll show you something in a second. But this is great to see infighting taking place between the uh, Kadarovites, the Chechnyans and the Russians. Not, the Akhmat as a special force, Chechen special force, is actually, I think, majority Russian uh, filled now these days. Although you know, sort of associated, well, very much associated with the uh, with the Chechens. So, yeah, great to see issue between them and Kadyrov, you know, boasting, uh, the Chechens boasting about something that didn't happen and that caused the Ukrainians to counterattack there. Now, I can't show you this. There, there, this is a, a video of at least, uh, what, at least two, maybe three of those soldiers supposedly being sniped and killed. The result of the intervention of the Russian DRG in the border village, 21 Russian soldiers dead thanks to uh, Kadyrov. Um, and so there you go. That's, that's again, the claim. So interesting stuff there. As Flash reports in the Sumi region, the number of attempts to enter the Russian subversive and reconnaissance uh, group has... Uh, recently decreased, said Andriy Demchenko, the spokesman for the State Border Service. Also, according to him, a certain decrease in shelling activity is recorded in the Sumi region. Quote, the situation in this direction remains fully controlled and the advance of the enemy is not recorded. So that is to say that in the Sumi area where the Russians might be uh, getting ready for an attack, there's actually been a decrease in DRGs, deep reconnaissance groups, m trying to raid across the border. There's been a decrease in shelling, decrease in activity in 
general, that's all good news for the Ukrainians, of course. Um, and I think that's all about the Sumi area. Yeah, so now we're going to go back to the area around... Um, oops, I need to turn on... i tell you what, I don't appear to have... Yes, I do. It's in the wrong colour, so I'm going to go and sort that out right now. So it certainly seems weird without the red here of Suryat maps to show where the Russians have attacked to. Uh, but the the kind of clear area is the Russian controlled zone as according to, uh, well, Andrew Perpetua's blue line there is the Russian defensive line and deep state map is the Russian defensive line as according to, yeah, the, the, yellow, the yellow line is deep state map, sorry. So first place we're going to look at is Leo Bouquet there, which is on the the leftward of the two salients, the western one. Uh, and in fact, let's get to that here. So uh, we have Ukraine having pushed back the Russians south of the area of Leo uh, Russia still controls the village, uh, but apparently having some success into that. And actually, no report says three days um, if we get that back three days into an operation to liberate Kliobake, uh, in the Kharkiv border region, sources confirmed to me that Ukrainian forces have entered the settlement and control a significant part. So that's slightly more than Global War Monitor says there. Uh, significant part while remaining Russian units in the settlement itself and its outskirts are being taken care of. For now, I have placed the city itself in a grey zone still and I'm awaiting further confirmation. Uh, so that is Kliobake there showing uh, that or uh, no report saying that the Ukrainians are back into that uh, village and that actually it's a grey zone. Now, Deep State map shows the southern part of grey zone. Andrew Perpetua has most of that map still under control of the, uh, the Russians, most of that settlement. It's a few outlying roads and uh, houses that he has. Uh, in the grey zone but yeah different different interpretation there but that could change on the next update so Kliobek is important because down to the south you've got Lipsy and that was one of the uh, the objectives for the Russians so that they could get within artillery range of, of Kharkiv supposedly and they seem to be further and further from Lipsy on a daily basis. Uh, then we have Vovchansk which um, most of the city of Vovchansk is controlled by the defence forces says Michael Weiss uh, and that is no, no change to the mapping, actually, for me, the, the map is here. But it, it does seem like the Russians are being pushed back there. Lots of talk about Vovchansk over the last few days. And in fact, the whole area, the Americans announced that the Russians have ground to a halt in their offensive here. And it seems to be an operational disaster. I read out what Andrew Perpetua said this morning about this and exactly what I was saying. All of the objectives have been failed. Uh, they have failed to achieve any of the objectives. They've wasted their troops there. They are drawing from either reserves or in training from the frontline areas elsewhere, meaning that they are not only failing but they're they are even more than failing so it's it's actually the the ukrainians you could argue are succeeding they've actually handed a win to the ukrainians because they're drawing their own troops away from places that could be useful for them for attacking so it just seems to be an absolute waste they they've lost an awful lot of troops there there are claims well in fact if we go uh phillips o'brien here says now exactly 30 days since the start of the harkiv offensive which was uh, saw a widespread discussion of a possible ukrainian collapse and russian strategic success well the u.s said openly that the russian advance in harkiv is all but over and yet there aren't really very many mainstream uh, sources media sources talking about this here the hill says uh, U.S. says Russia's advance in Kharkiv is all but over, but they don't really, it's not like big reporting from the area to say, you know, well done, the uh, the Ukrainians, what an amazing job they've done really in, in halting the Russian advance and pushing them back. Here, the Russian 41st Motorized Rifle Regiment has completely lost its combat capability, according to, albeit social networks. After the regiment was defeated in the Volchansk region and its soldiers were captured, the unit has withdrawn from the territory of Ukraine. The occupiers allegedly accused the Russian military group North and its commander, General Alexander Lapin, who I've talked about before, of incompetence on their pu personal public pages. Exactly what I said was likely to happen, right? That the, Here's this guy that has failed before, been kicked out, then brought back into uh 
to take charge of the northern attack into Kharkiv. Uh, he would have one, something to prove to try and clear his name, but two, also doesn't have a very good uh, record. He's not got good form. So you're, you're arguably getting a less than optimal general to do this attack that will have personal reasons for just piling in and uh, doubling down, having the sunk cost fallacy. You know, he he needs to prove it. I've got, I desperately, I'm going to throw even more men into this problem because I desperately need to come out of this looking good. And of course, doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results is a, is a sign of insanity. So it's not going to work. Here, people write that one of the groups, the 41st Rifle Regiment, was captured. Simon Rooster knew about the superior forces of the enemy, but still sent a small group, says this Russian source. The, uh, so that's a, a swear word for a, for a pedophile. On the land of the Russian did not transfer. Um, it, it's sort of weird translations here. And then here you can see all these other, this other conversation. Um, the, uh, this was for the best. They are, are withdrawing us. Part of the regiment has already reached the rear. And they're basically operationally ineffective now, the, that 41st. They have, they are, they've lost so many that they can't uh, continue to operate. So that is looking really bad, that area. Now, when we come to the rest of the front line, there are no, there's no particularly good news for the Ukrainians. That's the last of the good news there. There are some claims about Chazy VR, but the map is showing slight difference there. Anyway, no change. I suppose the good news is when there's no change, it's good news. So no change to the northeastern axis, no change to the southern axis, and no change to the Dnipro River axis. That is actually really good news, considering this is supposedly the, the, the period of Russian attack, of Russian offensive. We come to chat all the way down to Chesif Yar, and actually the micro district in, uh, to, in uh, the canal micro district to the west, sorry, to the east of Chesif Yar, over the, um, the canal here, is uh, under a lot of pressure. The Russians appear to be taking incrementally more of that. In, indeed, both mappers seem to indicate that half of that uh, settlement is under Russian control. All of it will be grey zone. This is not good news for the Ukrainians. The, they are looking at losing that um, important settlement there. Um, going to the north, Kalinivka and Bodonivka, yeah, Syriac maps had this whole area under Russian control. Neither of the mappers have that under Russian control. And down in the south, they've still not managed to get across the canal in any meaningful way as it stands. So this is this middle area is presently their most successful area. It, you know, it seems to swing from one to the other of these three three uh, bridgeheads. Uh, but this one is having the greatest success for the Russians. Both mappers, as mentioned, uh, giving some success there. Now, uh, we'll come to that in a second. Uh, it took Russians 15 months to advance 10 kilometers from Bakhmut, and now they're losing it. So here's this is a claim from Jay in Kiev to uh, go into a source saying, in Klishivka, the enemy's counterattack, that's a Russian, the Ukrainians have counterattacked, uh, and regained previously lost positions. That's a positive read on things in the area. I've not heard anything recently about Klishivka, but it could be that Ukrainians had done some small counterattack around Klishivka um, as well and had some success there. But I just thought I'd throw that one to you. But generally, it's all about uh, the... Canal micro district that here global war one says Russian soldiers were filmed entering a factory and raising the flag of the Donetsk People's Republic over the building in Canal District in Chesif Yar. Um, and not, not good news. Now, there's also claims from no reports here that in Solodar near Rodstolivka, which okay, if you remember, we've got Bakhmut here, we have uh Solodar with its salt mines there, and then north of there, we've got Rodstolivka. Around here, apparently, the Russians have pushed the Ukrainians back. I don't know that that's been, um, yeah, that's not been um, uh, claimed by any of the mappers I use here. But no report says in the Solidar sector, Russian advances were noted in an area where Ukraine also tried to advance during the summer offensive last summer. All small Ukrainian gains during that time have been reversed. So this appears to. Uh, indicate that the Russians are possibly back to uh, sort of that line, maybe uh, back to where the um, the May the thirtieth line. So white that white line was deep state maps on May the thirtieth last summer before the Ukrainians started their counteroffensive, and they did make some gains in this area. No report saying it has gone back, but that the Ukrainians have lost. 
uh, that land pretty much up to where the May the 30th line was. So no, neither of the mappers show that at the moment, but that might um, that might be changed tomorrow. So we come down from Chazif Yar, where the Russians are making some gains there by all accounts, to Avdivka, where Deep State Maps has uh, right a small amount of gains, just a little triangle there, north of Orchiratina, uh, west of Arkhangelska. And then we have them inching forward westwards towards the Procross direction really and kind of towards this road that they were possibly thinking of interdicting might be a little bit difficult you've got some topography some water features there to deal with but they are inching on and on in that direction it's fairly consistent albeit slow and then making some gains further to the south there by Umanska and you remember you've got the Derna River comes down here and dog legs to the west there. Uh, they have got over that and up this higher ground past Semenivka. And then you had Umanska here. Well, they've made some more gains along there slightly to the north of Umanska. And then some small gains to the west of Umanska. So not a huge amount. But if they grind away, keeping on doing this, then, you know, it all adds up. But then it, it, this is where you think, oh, on a micro level, goodness me, they keep taking land. And then you zoom out and you go... Yeah, but at what cost and is is that too much to worry about? So you don't want them to take land as long as they're being, you know, it's okay as long as they're being made to bleed for every kind of square meter that they get in a way that's advantageous for the Ukrainians. I, I can't speak to whether that is definitely happening in that Avdivka area, but it is slow and one would assume therefore it's grinding and attritional. Um, okay, going down south from the Avdivka salient. Oh, in fact, we do have some... Yeah, that's in that... Um, where is that? So Avdivka salient sector. Small Russian advances were recorded based on geolocated footage west of Umanska. Yep, that's, so that's what I was just telling you. That's that tiny little area there. Okay, uh, when we come further to the south, we have some gains, as according to Andrew Perpetua, inside the... Krasna Harifka uh, city or town, uh, right in the middle actually, some gains in a sort of um, uh, L shape there. The Russians expanding north and west there. Don't have too much any details really about that, but some gains as according to Andrew with the mapping. And actually some fairly significant gains, or at least larger than we've seen elsewhere, as according to Andrew Perpetua for sure. So this is where his lines previously were. Um, so this whole area uh, now under Russian control. I don't know. Sometimes there are moves here that are counterattacks or attacks even from the Russians. And sometimes it's because actually Andrew doesn't get data from satellite imagery there there are areas that he very rarely get past with satellite imagery and i remember him talking about this particular area so sometime back about two three months ago there were massive changes along here because he suddenly got some satellite imagery that showed that the russians actually controlled way more than he thought they did it was not that he, he didn't think they did it he didn't know and had suspicions but waited for confirmation it could be that that's part of it or the russians have attacked and taken quite a large amount of area but considering that's a fairly large amount of area i don't know whether that's something you'd expect in just a day's worth of attacking so it could be that it is a bit, a bit of a major rejig but i don't know uh who who knows um Nonetheless, the, the reality is that the Russians have made you know grinding gains and down south quite a large gain, uh, and they are continuing to do that. But this is two days' worth of gains as well, so that's also worth remembering. Um, uh, uh, yeah, right. What we'll do now is just before I leave you, just talk a little bit about what happened overnight. So we know that Crimea was absolutely hammered with ATACAN's missiles, and one of the biggest pieces of news was that uh, these there were six places that were broadly hit, but these are the three places where we think there were S400, S300 uh, batteries, the air defense batteries and radars. So map of Ukrainian ATACM strikes on Crimea on the night of 9th and 10th of June. Approximately 10 to 12 ATACMs hit their targets reported by Russian sources and confirmed by the Ukrainian military. One, Jankoy, that's up here. Two radar stations were apparently taken out. Uh, two, Chornomorska, that's over here, uh, where an S-300 or S-400 battery was hit. And here, Hromovka, where two S-300s and two radars were hit. 
Now, you start adding these up to the previous hits on Jankoy and um, kind of Yev Pretoria area, uh, Simferopol, Sevastopol, etc., etc., Saki Air Base, and to Cape Tarkanku, we have seen a number of air defense batteries destroyed. Uh, you are getting to a point where you're wondering whether this is just to allow things like F-16s to operate with uh, with greater um, or with less vulnerability over Crimea, or whether there is a chance of Ukraine doing something a bit a bit uh, courageous here, or maybe stupid. I don't know. But if you clear out, if you make Crimea blind, if you really spend a good couple of months hammering away at those Russian air defense systems, which they are doing, it could be that every time those radars are turned on, they give a signature and they have less and less ability to hit missiles. So as you take one more S-300, or today, as we've seen, it's more than that. We've got two radars, four radars, four radars, and an amount, maybe three uh three s300 s400 batteries i don't know if that's launchers components batteries whatever but with each passing night like that russia is less able to take out things that are, that are attacking them from the air drones missiles helicopters and planes we'll come to that so drones and missiles then leave the crime even more vulnerable and then those missiles have even greater success and it's like a snowball till eventually there is nothing left in Crimea then the Russians are faced with one of two things do they pull out of Crimea we're going to come to that in a second do, one do they pull out of Crimea or two do they pile more resources into Crimea to keep trying to defend Crimea from the air and if they do that they have to pull those S-300s and, and book systems and whatever and radars in from elsewhere that then makes elsewhere weak if you do that you keep protecting Crimea but then if Ukraine are being successful in taking them out all you're doing is like a meat assault all you're doing or meat defense is pulling in uh, really really high value equipment for it to get destroyed and then you're leaving elsewhere vulnerable so then the Ukrainians will hit elsewhere with greater success and then eventually hit Crimea again. So it's until Ukraine have an advantage. It seems fairly apparent that they have an advantage because they can strike Russian air defense systems and radar systems with old 40 year old missiles. And the Russians can't do anything to defend against that. And that will keep on snowballing until Ukraine can do some serious, serious damage. So then, as I said, the question is, do the Russians bring in more air defences to keep uh, protecting Crimea, or do they cut their losses and get out of Dodge? If they cut their losses and get out of Dodge, this then allows Ukraine to hit Crimea with um, paratroopers and Marines. So we saw the other day that they, they were doing marine training for doing amphibious landing. And as I said the other day, this is really cool. It looks really great. And they're doing combined arms maneuvers and all this kind of funky stuff. When are they going to actually use that? I mean, is that just a PR stunt or is that actually useful for a potential attack at some point? Surely they're doing that training because it will have some tangible use. Well, you could imagine a point where... Russia are so weak in, in defensive capabilities on Crimea that they cannot uh, protect from the air because they don't seem to be able to protect from the air at the moment from ATACMs and drones, etc., etc. They can't protect from the air for uh, closer and closer use of uh, fixed-wing airframes, uh, aircraft, and also your rotary helicopter attacks, dropping off... Um, dropping off paratroopers and your boats dropping off marines you can imagine an attack there there has already been an attack here at uh, mayak and olenivka so this area the marines have landed uh, and they have had success there so if they've done that before when the russians were much stronger with their air defenses and their radars now what's going to happen if they're much weaker now remember as well so part of the spotting of what will happen around here with attacks amphibious attacks is that, that will be done by helicopter and jets right they will be patrolling around here why are they how are they patrolling around there because they're protected by the s300s and s400s and radars if you don't have that you won't get the um the russian jets and helicopters operating here or they'll be far more cautious they might be back here and if that's the case that gives 
even greater permission for the Ukrainians to attack by amphibious and uh, air landings. Really interesting, I think. Now, having said all of that, th here's a data point to add into that. It's just come out today. So this is from a partisan organization in Crimea. Partisan movement attest reports that Russian armed forces... Uh, air defense servicemen in Crimea have been instructed to evacuate their families to military camps in the southern military district. In other words, guys, you get your family out here and we're going into Zaporizhia. Um, we're going into Donetsk, southern military district, or maybe, I don't know, into, into Russia proper. Uh, this directive coincides with the relocation of air defense systems to the Belgorod region. So not only are they screwed in Crimea, they're getting screwed in Belgorod. They've lost S-400s maybe two or three whole uh, batteries or certainly elements of the batteries up there. So what do they do? Do they draw more air defense systems into Belgorod? But actually Crimea needs them. So you've got two areas that are now desperate for air defense systems. You're going to have to draw them from somewhere. They're not manufacturing these. This is a real problem for the for the Russians. This is honestly, this is potentially massively important for the Ukrainians. This directive coincides with the relocation of air defense systems to the Belgorod region, raising security concerns in occupied Crimea due to reduced coverage. Additionally, the Russian military is forming new mobile air defense teams using ZU-23 too. So these are 23 millimeter cannons on the back that the, they put on the back of like really old school anti-aircraft guns, like older than older than Gepards. And worse, I mean, Gepards are self-propelled ra with radar, self-propelled anti-aircraft guns. Here we have much older pieces of kit um, on the back of a Ural truck. They're using them as their mobile air defence in Crimea, indicating a strategic shift towards this area uh, with a reduced focus on occupied Crimea. Absolutely incredible. So let me know what you think, think about that. Am I being too positive? I think this is an incredibly significant shift that we've seen. And it started with the Russians committing Harry Kerry up here, that operational disaster that allowed the Americans to change their um, restrictions. It then got the Russians losing maybe three air defense batteries of their, of their, their best air defense, uh, S-300s and S-400s. Uh, and then it continued to happen in Crimea, double whammy, what did Russia do? Anyway, thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. Appreciate all your comments and all of your support. Take care. Toodle pips.